And I'm speaking to Sue Bull, who is the Socialist Alliance candidate for the seat of Corio, which is in Geelong, Victoria. I'm running for the seat of Corio, and I don't know if people know this, but it's a, it's it's the central part of Geelong, and there are huge numbers of people in the seat of Corio that are extremely disadvantaged. It's one of parts of Corio are some of the poorest places in Australia, and have been for decades. Um, schools are underfunded. The healthcare system is an absolute mess, really, you know, comparatively. Um, aged care is a huge issue down here. Uh, and, and we're just horrified. <laughs> we're horrified that COVID has shown that nobody cares. Um, the 25% wage claim that aged care workers are going for is largely, it's barely even hitting the front page. And yet we've got a desperate shortage. And meanwhile, there's no jobs being created down here. So where's the investment in infrastructure which would provide jobs for a lot of people, not happening. So they're the key things. Our message in Socialist Alliance about make the billionaires pay, pay tax, it really hits a chord down here because people know that's where the money's gone. What, what will the $250 once-off payment for pensioners that was announced by the treasurer last night? And I think for an extra 420 tax cuts for low and uh, middle income earners, what's that going to do for them? I just think it's an insult. <laughs> it's an absolute insult. They struggled before COVID. They struggled horrifically during COVID. You know, once the height of the payouts was over, they've struggled and they're really struggling again. And there's a lot of, um, it's not just about struggling. There's a lot of fear and disadvantage. And those payouts, um, are nothing. It's it's an insult. You know, it won't even cover their rent. And then the tax cuts to, they're clearly uh, the government trying to win votes amongst middle class, you know, more moderately middle class people. And people who, like I know around here, yes, some of the small business people will go, yes, thank goodness I've got a wage cut, uh, a tax cut. But what most people think is they want to see that money go into health and education, public transport, the environment. They don't want to see a few pennies come back into their own back pocket. Services, that's a thing which uh, a lot of people really valued um, during the pandemic. Uh, and um, But they're all stressed. Nurses are stressed, teachers are stressed. Um, so we, we really ha are being expected to carry on with the same, I think, in the next period. Um, what are you hearing from service workers? In Victoria, there's been um, a lot of the service areas going for wage increases. And they're counting themselves lucky if they get a 2% wage increase, which is nowhere near enough. Like we've lost, some areas have lost over the last 20 years as much as 20% of their pay packet. Um, and now the, the tiny little bits that they're being offered through their EBAs is not even meeting um, their needs, let alone a catch up. It, it just doesn't exist. So people don't feel as if they're getting ahead. Meanwhile, in the health sector, but also in education, they've worked harder than ever in the last two years to keep things going. Now, these are workers that are used to doing, and they shouldn't be, but often doing unpaid overtime. And their remuneration is not even meeting their day-to-day -day needs, let alone putting anything away for the future. That idea is gone. So they're very angry. That, you know, it's suppressed anger. The in the teachers union, for instance, their enterprise agreement nearly didn't get up because it's a lousy agreement. They want more. I think 40% or more voted against that agreement. It'll get up, but by the skin of its teeth. Now, what about young workers. See, I come from the construction industry and we've fought for decades to get apprenticeships back. Like, um, I don't know if people realise this, but there's almost no apprenticeships anymore. Um, now, what's the difference between an apprenticeship and a traineeship? The difference is that an apprenticeship, you come out, you're actually trained because there's a, there's a signed agreement there. You're actually trained through the TAFEs. You come out with a skill. Traineeships, sometimes you do too, but very often traineeships is just a cheap way of paying people to fill a hole. 
and it's not actually then they're, they're not always any involving any real traineeships just cheap payment what we're seeing is that concept of apprenticeships is going even traineeships there's not many um, any concept of long term you know having being able to have a job for long term it's just gone so I think young workers are thinking oh I'm I'm never really going to get ahead and they really are worried they'll never be able to buy a house unless they get an inheritance which is becoming harder and harder so no I think they're not feeling at all positive about what's going on at the moment there's a lot of fear you you went along to the 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 school students um, strike for climate um, yes. now young people also apart from 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 finding it a lot harder to make ends meet to get jobs to to find housing also face uh, the burden of uh, the climate emergency but young people have a far greater understanding of climate climate issues than um, a lot of older people and they are worried about their future but here's the interesting thing there's also an amazing positivity so so they come to the the rallies and col feel a collective strength and actually feel that there's a certain amount of hope so whilst people are very frightened young people especially are frightened about the future there's also this positivity they still feel that if you fight hard enough you can win out together and we are seeing a lot of that like we're seeing a great deal of that so that's the contra contradictory thing about the climate that's not to take away from the fact that people don't see this as an utter emergency they do see it as a total emergency especially with the floods i mean we weren't affected in Victoria, but you're just watching as endless floods after endless fires. Um, there wouldn't be a young person in Australia today who isn't worried about what's going to happen in the future. Another message which um, the Morrison uh, government has been very pushing very hard on is this whole fear of, uh, you know, war, um, you know, supposedly we are being threatened by China, now Russia, and uh, and 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 they're spending that they're actually increasing the size of the military um, to the highest it's been since uh, the Vietnam War. Um, yeah. How do you think this is playing to ordinary workers? Um, are they being caught up? You know, in this thing, we've got to spend billions on getting. Um, the new missiles, submarines, nuclear submarines, cyber warfare. Um, do you think people are buying this? I think there's a certain level at which it, they do. See, I, I think all the anti-China stuff for what, nearly a decade now, I think that there is a growing fear that China is seen as um, a predator. And everything that we're, we're that we're listening to at the moment is actually pushing people into that feeling that this is the, the predator. Nobody, for instance, supports Russia and its its attack on Ukraine. But in Australia, I think workers think that it's China that's the predator, and they therefore the response to having our own nuclear submarines has been muted which I think is very worrying. And there is also among certain sectors, you know, a, a certain anticipation that they will get jobs out of the submarine industry. So this is really backward. And it does open up a question for those of us in the progressive movements as to how we might win back an anti-war sentiment, um, an anti-nuclear sentiment, it does pose that question. And we're not in the same situation that we were in the 80s. Because if everyone remembers, in the 80s, we are coming out of the horror of the Vietnam War and the predatory nature of US imperialism, and that helped to build an anti-nuclear consciousness. Whereas instead, now, 40 years down the track, you've got workers not really remembering that period and buying into, you know, the murder and, and others, you know, big business-led, um, portrayal of China as the predator, um, not the United States. Um, gone is the memory that the US used to have its finger on the nuclear button in every conflict since the Second World War. You know, they threatened to use nuclear weapons. That, that, that memory's gone. 
So I think, yeah, we've got a lot of work to do in, in telling people the truth and trying to rebuild an anti-war sentiment. At least some sections of the trade union movement starting to clock on that there could be jobs and not just jobs, good, stable, reliable, well-paid jobs um, in, a, in, in, in building a, a more environmentally sustainable future. You know, Nets. green energy now is becoming, you know, it's actually becoming more competitive yes. Yes. Uh, than, than the old fossil fuel energies. Um, where do you think the trade union movement is at on this issue? And, and what, and could yes. they do more? They could definitely do more. In fact, it's interesting you bring this up. We've got a group down here called the Environmental Jobs Alliance, Geelong. And we had a meeting last night because we're trying to get a, a sustainable jobs expo happening here. And it was actually the discussion because it, people are probably aware of this, but there's been a great deal of <clears throat> debate about the fact that if we could invest, if Australia could invest heavily in renewables because we've got ample resources of sun and wind, we could have very, very cheap electrical power, like possibly amongst the cheapest in the world. And it's that cheap power that could then help us kickstart, restart a manufacturing sector. Um, and so there's been a lot of debate and discussion about this. Now, that's one avenue. The other, of course, is the renewable energy itself, which, of course, does have jobs involved in it. Um, not as many as you'd hope, because at the moment, all of our uh, wind and solar equipment is actually made overseas because we don't have those industries here at the moment, not on any large scale. But that could all change with cheap energy. So, yes, there's a lot of debate going on about this there's a huge role that unions could play <clears throat> and maybe they are beginning to like victorian trades hall at our meeting last night was saying that um there is a growing understanding of this um there's been cynicism because so much of the equipment that's coming in from overseas is actually of a, a poor quality and so you know break, like the wind stuff breaks down all the time and so on but not as much as it's made out. And indeed, we're hearing down here that the wind power that's coming from Bass Strait often, uh, or around that sort of area, is often turned off because it's creating too much energy. So, you know, what a complete waste. Um, and I'm sure this is happening nationally. So, yes, I think there's a huge role for unions and it's a growing understanding. My criticism is it's not growing fast enough because I think we have to take all of this stuff up and have it all ready to be carbon neutral at least by 2030. You know, like we have to be renewable energy, fossil fuels out of the picture by 2030 if um, we'd have any hope for the future. And it's that debate that I don't think is happening enough. And unions could play a much bigger role in this. Now, let me just go back to, to, to make a little link with the, with, with the, the latest budget. Um, so the, 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 the Morrison government is pitching to the Australian people for an election and it's given a bit of a cash splash. Uh, but in addition, it is putting the basic argument that the economy has been in their good hands for all this time because they've, they've, they've uh, by, by um, giving the tax cuts, which are mostly going to, to rich people and big companies, they have grown the economy. They've They've, they've, uh, you know, they've, they've and, and that's the where the future lies, you know, give money to the big companies, to the employers, and they can create more jobs. And that's the future. What, what's your comment on this? And, and what's your observation on the response of the Labour opposition? Look, uh, I, I heard this morning someone saying, oh, this is just a, a budget for the election. <laughs> and we all knew that was going to be the case. Um, so what a surprise. No cuts in this, no, no big cuts in this budget because they're trying to suck us into voting Liberal and seeing them as a safe pair of hands. So little tiny tip bits, that's the reality of what it is, offering little tiny tip bits here and there. The response of the opposition, pathetic, absolutely pathetic as on everything. What Albanese's done all along is just this whole, his lesson from short and losing the previous election was just make yourself a small target. Don't promise anything. Don't make any, 
that don't make any big commitments and so on. <clears throat> and their response to the budget is exactly the same. So what they're going to do is just nip around the edges and say, oh, you know, there should have been a bit more here, there should have been a bit more there. Neither party is prepared to take on the big challenges. Where's the investment in um, climate, for starters? You know, where's the slap in the face to fossil fuel? You know, we want you out of the picture by 2030. Where's that? Not there, because they're still subsidising it. Where's the big investment in renewables, you know, da da da? Not there. South Australia is still miles ahead of everybody else, even though they had a Liberal government. Um, federal government's not even prepared to catch up to what South Australia is doing. So pathetic. And what's the Labor Party saying? Almost nothing. In fact, they've gone back on their promises over, uh, over the climate. They haven't actually moved forward. How would they move forward? They would invest in renewables and create large scale jobs. That's what you do when you invest in infrastructure and they could do it, but they're not prepared to promise that. I heard last night, I think that there's only about five to 8,000 jobs left in, in um, fossil fuels. That's what the union movement's saying. That's almost nothing. Whereas I think they were saying in renewables, you can create something like 3,000 jobs a year. It's a lot along that level. It's a huge potential, but the major companies are so, uh, um, parties are so gutless that they won't take on the fossil fuel industry. So there's all of that. Where's the jobs in aged care? What are they going to do about the crisis that we've got in aged care? We're just going to have continuous you know, Royal Commission's investigations telling us exactly what like, we know. We need more workers in aged care and they need a 25% wage increase. What is that? Neither party's promising that. So, you know, they're just the basics. And then you overlay it. We've got a huge shortage about to happen in education, public education. Federal government keeps saying, oh, that's a state issue. No, it's a state and federal issue. They've got to invest in these things. So, no, the budget leaves me feeling just as despairing as I was before. And Albanese is not really putting forward anything different whatsoever. It's just nitpicking. I'm afraid that's what Labor looks like. They look like nitpickers.